The Lord be with you. It's good to see all of you here this morning for United Methodist Women's Sunday. Today's a special Sunday for us here at Central, uh, where we are celebrating 150 years of Methodist women together in mission. And so uh, today, our women are going to be leading the service in different ways. You can see in our bulletins, we have more information about some of our women's small groups. And also, our women are selling pecans, and that money goes toward missions in our community. Also, uh, on your opportunity form, you can find out more information about some things that are coming up. Uh, the Healthy Harvest Community Health Fair is going to be this Saturday, um, and that they will have activities for families, uh, all kinds of fun stuff to do, so I wanted to let you know about that. Um, our Celebration Sunday is coming up in a few weeks. On the back, you can find out more about our annual Trunk or Treat, um, and we do need some folks uh, to park cars in our parking lot and help us uh, with trunk or treat. We usually have hundreds of kids from the community that come through, and so this is one of our big annual outreach events. Uh, we can also use folks bringing candy um, or helping us with our hot dog dinner, and so we appreciate uh, you being together in mission with us. And now let's prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. I'm Linda Masters, and I will serve this morning as your liturgist. And I invite your attention to the call to worship. We truly believe that Central United Methodist Church is a family of God. It is here that we love and follow the risen Christ, teach our children, and meet our friends. It is here that we find faith when we doubt, strength when we are weak, and comfort when we suffer loss. It is here that we seek to follow the plan of God's will and celebrate the joy of his love. And so, to all, old and young, wise and unlearned, rich and poor, saint and sinner, we at Central open wide our doors and in the name of Jesus Christ bid you welcome to our Father's house. And now let us worship together and we will sing the hymn that you will see on the screen as a fire is meant for burning. Will you stand, please? Thank you. 
join me in our prayer of confession. It is on the screen. Most merciful God, we confess, confess that we, we have sinned against you in thought and word and in deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. I just mentioned that we are a family of God in this building as well as out of this building. So will you please greet your brothers and sisters in the name of Christ. Our children's choir will sing for us after which the other children may come forward and Natalie will do our children's moment. I think this is the one I'm supposed to have. <laughs> Good morning. I think we can do a little better than that. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Can anybody tell me what the word parable means? Some of us in Sunday school learned that word this morning. Juliana? Something that's given to you from God. That's a really good answer. Grayson? Do you know what the word parable means? A story, that's right. It's a fancy word for a story. And today we will be learning the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So Jesus said there once was a rich man dressed in very nice clothes and they were purple and fine linen. He had everything that he wanted and he lived for himself and the things he wanted and he didn't make very much time for God. A poor man named Lazarus sat at the rich man's gate. He was covered in sores and very hungry. Lazarus wished that he could eat the crumbs that fell on the floor from the rich man's table. And even wild dogs came up and licked the sores on his skin. Lazarus loved God and had faith that God would help him. One day, Lazarus passed away, and the angels carried him to heaven where Abraham was. The rich man passed away too, but he did not go to heaven. He went to a place of suffering without God. 
the rich man looked up and could see Lazarus with Abraham in heaven, and he cried out, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to help me. I am suffering. Abraham said back to him, Remember your life. You had so many good things, and Lazarus had nothing but trouble. Now Lazarus is comforted here while you are suffering. Then Abraham said to the rich man, There is a great divide between us, like a big pit, and no one from here can cross over to you, neither can anyone from there cross over to us. The rich man begged of Abraham, Abraham, please send Lazarus to warn my brothers to have faith in God and change so they will not come to this place of suffering and pain. Abraham said to the rich man, They already have the stories in the Bible to warn them. They can read them whenever they wish. They should read and learn from them and have faith in God. So, I'm going to hand out a cup to each of you. Take one and pass it down. And let this cup help you remember that sometimes your cup will be very full and you will have enough to share with someone who might need something in their cup. And sometimes your cup will be empty and you might need help and hope that someone fills your cup just like you shared when your cup was full. We'll let everybody get a cup and then we'll say a quick prayer. Sometimes your cup will be full and sometimes it'll be empty and then you can help somebody else. Help that. Maybe you can use it for a microphone sometimes too. <laughs> Will everybody pray with me? Thank you, God, that you give us friends who share and friends that help us. Help us to remember to help those in need and have faith in you. Amen.
Good morning. The scripture today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And this is the story of the Good Samaritan. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? He responded, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. So he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him up, and left him near death. Now, it just so happened that the it just so happened that a priest who was going down the same road, when he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came up by that spot saw the injured man, crossed over to the other side of the road, and went on his way. A Samaritan, who was on a journey, came to where the man was, but when he saw him, he moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him, bandaged his wounds, tended them with oil and wine. Then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took full, two full days worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, take care of him and when I return I will pay you back for any additional cost. What do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered thieves? Then the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy towards him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I would like to introduce to you two very special women who will bring our messages to us this morning. Debbie Ray is our district UMW president and Virginia Miller is our local UMW president. Will you please greet them warmly? Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, may the thoughts of my mind and the words from my mouth be pleasing to you. Amen. So I want to thank you all for asking me to be here today. I love to talk about United Methodist women. And we have a real reason to celebrate. March 23rd, 1869, marked the the date of the beginning of what would be 150 years in mission by women. I don't think there's too many organizations that can say that. So I'm sure that many of you already know the story. Two missionaries and their wives returned to Boston from their service in India. The women were particularly distressed because the women of India could not receive health care because they could not be doctored by a, a man, a male doctor. And the women, of course, were not educated because who would bother to educate a girl? So these women met with six other women on a dark and stormy night and decided to discuss how they could help. What could they do to help? So they decided they were going to send a woman doctor and a female educator to India. Now, it didn't happen overnight, but of course, they started a fundraiser. Does that sound familiar, United Methodist women? They wrote letters to other women. They decided they pledged two cents a week 
and they covenanted to pray about the project. Later on that year, they sent a female doctor, Dr. Clara Swain, and a female educator, Isabella Thoburn, to India. And the mission work that those women started still goes on today. Dr. Clara Swain started a clinic. It's now a hospital, and it still functions as such. Isabella Thoburn began with two girls, and now it's a college, educates women. So if you want something done, get a woman to do it. <laughs> this began the formation of United Methodist Women, and it was called the Women's Foreign Missionary Society. Now through many years and you know, kind of organizational shifts and mergers and so forth, the Women's Home Missionary Society, the Wesleyan Service Guild, the Ladies' Aid Societies, and the Women's Society of Christian Service, which I know many of you are familiar with because your mothers and grandmothers probably served with that, with that service. The, the women saw that women needed to help and that if they helped the women, that would help children and youth. And that's our purpose still today, 150 years later. We are still in mission around the world. In 1973, United Methodist Women became the women's mission arm of the United Methodist Church. Now, how do we do that? We support over 300 mission institutions around the world. 98 of those are in the United States, and five are within our conference. One is in Asheville, Brooks Hall Home, which I know you're familiar with. So we support community centers, daycare centers, shelters, schools, youth programs. Harriet Jane Olson, who is the CEO of United Methodist Women, says we try to help governments see the world the way we see the world because it will impact women, children, and youth, which can only be a good thing. Taking care of our children and providing leadership, training for our youth, will definitely impact our future. I help lead a United Methodist Women's Circle of girls in the third through the sixth grade. I want them to grow up in a world where females are valued and where they can be the change that needs to happen in our world. I want them to know that God loves them and that he wants them to share that love with others. We involve them in missions and in social justice issues too. We put together UMCORD kits and Armenia Christmas boxes. We encourage tolerance and speaking out against bullying. We help them grow their spiritual lives, and I believe they will be leaders in our church, in United Methodist Women, and in our world. Now, some have called us loving troublemakers, which doesn't mean we love causing trouble. But it means sometimes we cause trouble because of our love. We stand up and let our voice be heard when we see injustice. We march for climate justice. We advocate for women's equality and women's rights. We marched for civil rights. We write our legislators and speak out about human trafficking, children who can't read, or don't get enough to eat, girls forced into marriage at a young age, care of immigrants on the border. We advocate for maternal health and child issues because our mortality rate in this country is dismal. We are trying to break the school to prison pipeline. We try to speak for those who can't speak for themselves because they are too young to vote too poor, the wrong gender, the wrong skin color. And we've been doing this for 150 years. Jesus' admonition to us to take care of the women and children is still true. And for 15 years, our conference led the nation in mission giving. 
We are a part of this conference. And in our area, some of the most economically depressed areas abound. And yet, the women in this conference gave over $650,000 to help people that they don't even know. We put our dollars together and help women and children. Now that doesn't even begin to talk about what women do in their local communities. And you know this because you help Haywood Christian Ministries, Haven House, Reach Shelter, Pathway Center, Backpacking Ministry, Armenia Christmas Boxes, Umcore Kits, the list goes on and on. We're not just about service, though, because we are to be a community of women whose purpose is to know God and to experience freedom as whole persons through Jesus Christ. That's part of our stated purpose. We are to bring people to discipleship through our love for Jesus, which asks us to love our neighbor. We provide opportunities and resources to grow spiritually, become more deeply rooted in Christ, and put our faith into action. We are to develop a creative, supportive fellowship so that women find the support and encouragement they need to become whole persons. When one of us is suffering, we bring food, those famous casseroles, and hugs and prayers. We train women to become leaders in their communities so that they can address the needs of their communities. We live out our faith by turning our faith and love into action. We try to bring hope to women and children around the world. And as Jane said, faith without works is dead. Now, how do I come to be here? I have been involved in United Methodist Women for over 30 years. I have held offices in my circle, but I have always found it impossible to stand up in front of a group and speak. I have taught young children Sunday school for many years, done puppet ministry from behind a screen. A few years ago, I asked God to help me overcome this fear, and he put me on the praise team in front of the congregation, singing because I love to sing. Now, I can't read music. I can't read the music without my reading glasses. I can't play an instrument. I had no idea what I was doing there. But God had a plan. And in doing that, through my love of singing, I joined, uh, I became a unit officer. Then I started going to district events. Then I volunteered to be a district officer, and now here I am. That's how those things happen sometimes, isn't it? I also try to be helpful in my community. Right now, that means being involved in the Literacy Initiative, which I know Pastor Paul has talked to you all about. And that's going to be an ongoing effort that we are all going to be part of. I know that God sends me places and it's okay because he will equip me for whatever it is he wants me to do. Now you may ask yourself, is United Methodist Women still relevant 150 years later? And I say a resounding yes because we are needed as much now as we ever were. Children are still going hungry. Women are still abused. They are still forced into marriage, treated as chattel. One in five children live in poverty in this county. Now I find that troublesome in the richest country in the world, don't you? As one person, I may not be able to do much, but as one of 800,000 women, my voice can be added to those of those women who are speaking out about our needs today. In May of 2018, I attended assembly in Columbus, Ohio, where thousands of United Methodist women members gathered for a few days of a, 
of listening and learning. And I know that we are about tolerance and inclusion. Now, I've been studying our history, our 150 year history, and I'm aware that we weren't always like that. And I'm also aware that we've made mistakes. But women have always shown strong leadership. I hope and pray that United Methodist Women will be around for another 150 years. And to accomplish that, five years ago, the Legacy Fund was created. Uh, it creates an, an endowment fund, a permanent endowment fund, so that contributions to it will raise and support women's missions in the future. So according to women's ability, we ask women to donate to it, $18.69, or $186.90 per unit towards that effort so that the funds are available for those purposes in the future. Uh, no matter how you feel about the outcome of the General Conference, I hope that we recognize that we need mature spiritual leaders and that pain was caused to some. We don't know what will happen to the United Methodist Church, but I believe United Methodist women will continue to serve our communities. We will share the love of God with all his people. I hope we will continue to listen, be present, and see people as people. As John Wesley said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, to all the people you can, by all the, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, as long as ever you can. We recently lost a 95-year-old member who was the last remaining member of her unit remained active in her church, remained active in her United Methodist Women, made her pledge and kept it. That sounds like United Methodist Women to me. Thank you for your kind hospitality today. Um, I was gonna share a poem, but in the interest of time, I'm going to let Virginia come up. Good morning. And thank you, Debbie. I will assure you that though United Methodist women are 150 years old, I've only been a member for a little over 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may have been longer than that. And the scripture Valerie read to us, and I thought long and hard and prayed hard about what scripture we should use today and finally landed on this. And I want us to look at it closer. This young man came to Jesus and he said, what must I do? to be saved, to have eternal life. Well, he was an expert in the law. He knew because he had said it by over and over every day, this bit of scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So why was this a question? Well, Many Bible scholars think that about that time, a lot of the scribes were saying, be careful who your neighbor is. You don't have to help non-Jewish people, only Jewish people. And so that may have been behind the question. So what did Jesus say? Well, Jesus was a radical because he started off with this Samaritan. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They had nothing to do with them. 
they would not speak to them. And yet Jesus started with the Samaritan. But let's, let's back up. Anyway, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Down about 3,600 feet because Jerusalem was on a mountain and Jericho was by the Dead Sea. And how did they travel? They might have had a donkey. Almost walking would have been preferable. 20 miles of crooked, steep switchbacks in the hot desert sun. He went down. This road was known because it was the hiding place of many, many thieves, and most people would not go alone. Don't know why this man was alone, but he was. And it got beat up. Who came by to see him? First, the priest. Well, why would the priest not help him? Who knows? But if the priest had started to help him and the man had died on him, then the man would have been unclean. He couldn't have fulfilled his priestly functions for at least a week or two. That may have been it. We don't know. The next person, the Levite, the Levite was the priestly family too, and he seemed to be a little more curious, interested. But finally, why did he back up? Why didn't he help? He went on. Then came the hated Samaritan and his little donkey. What do we know about the Samaritan? Think about it. They were hated by the Jews. We know this man may have been hated, but he had a lot of guts and gumption, didn't he? He was very, very practical. He put this man on his donkey. And can't you see, leading a donkey, who knows how many miles, through the switchbacks, down that mountain, in that hot sun. But he did it. He cared. He was practical. And so at the end of the story, he went up to the uh, innkeeper and he had good credit. We know that. Who else would volunteer to take care of an almost dying man without any pay? And so the innkeeper accepted him. When Jesus finished it, he then asked the question, so who was the neighbor? And the young law expert had to say, well, the Samaritan. The Samaritan was the neighbor, of course. And Jesus' response was, go do thou likewise. Did this mean that he was to take on the patience, the love, the perseverance? I think so. It's been an honor for me to be a part of your church, to get to know you, and I'm so impressed with the way you work together and reach out and love people. And when people ask us in United Methodist Women, how do you do this and how do you do that? Our answer is, our church does it together. We couldn't start, we couldn't get anywhere without your help, and we know that. And we surely, surely appreciate that. And Debbie gave you the listing of, of the many things we were involved in. And I guess we'll be involved in more and more in the future and look forward. We in United Methodist Women, and let me stop to say, we led you in shoeboxes for Armenia, the children in Armenia that have been so beat up by constant wars and earthquakes. 
And last Sunday, our church came up with shoe boxes for 44 children that will go on to Armenia. Well, we in United Methodist Women work with you locally, and we work around the world, as Debbie indicated. And in thinking about that, I'd like to tell you about three people, three United Methodist women that have represented us and you across the country. And the first one, I'll start with her, her um, it wasn't a funeral service, what do you call it? <laughs> Memorial service. Her name was Lucy Gist. She's a tiny little woman, used to come to church with Bobby and me every once in a while. But she died. We had her memorial service at Brooks Hall and were amazed because there was about three carloads of people from Bethlehem Center, Charlotte. Bethlehem Center is owned by United Methodist Women. It's in the middle of the poorest part of Charlotte. And Lucy was brought there about 1960 as the director. She'd been gone 25 or 30 years. Why would these people still come? And the sharing time they said, we remember Miss Lucy. Miss Lucy got out and not only did she help in programming and all this, she walked the streets. She knew us all. She talked to us. She had faith in us. And as a result of Miss Lucy's work, we now have from our community several teachers, a few attorneys and one judge, and one person in the State Department in D.C. They had faith in them. And so this was Lucy's legacy. Another person, the next one, was Norma Kerberg, the first United Methodist missionary to Nepal. Everybody knows about Nepal and Mount Everest, where the land doesn't go this way, it goes this way. Norma was the very first missionary in a time where in Nepal, they couldn't allow outside people to come and preach. In fact, if you changed your religion at that time, it meant an automatic year's imprisonment. If you proselytized, it meant four years in prison. And so Norma, as a young woman, was the very first missionary and she had, was working to establish clinics in many places in the mountains because only medical or agricultural missionaries could go. And so they loved and worked. 15, 20 years later, Norma was head of United Methodist Committee on Relief. In other words, she was my boss. And she took some of the board members through that part of the world, to Nepal. They stopped at one of these clinics that Norma had helped to found. And the woman that ran the clinic said, you'll, you'll stay and you'll sing and pray with me, won't you? Well, Norma was joyful. She was overcome. Sure, she'd love to do it. You're a Christian, this is wonderful. The lady said yes, and she took, gave figures of the people who are now Christian in Nepal. That meant they had served their years imprisonment for being Christian. And then almost that many more who were under the cover Christian. Well, life has changed in Nepal now. After Norma left United Methodist Committee on Relief, she had a chance to go back and she enjoyed it, worked at it, jumped at it. One third person, and I'm glad we're having the session on what's happening down along the border. 
The person I'd like to tell you about this time is much, much younger. She's probably under 30. Her name is Cindy Johnson. She works part of the year training the newcoming deaconesses and home missioners, but the rest of the time she works down along the border. And recently, if you've been watching the paper, you know that the laws changed where, as before, the law was that people coming from one of the Central American countries across Mexico could come into the U.S. and get on a list to see if they could become a part of the U.S. But our laws changed. The people didn't know that. And so, just south of the border, across the bridge, there gathered more and more and more people waiting to be admitted. People without food, people who were desperate. Cindy Johnson was among the group that went with beans and rice to help feed them and helped for a long time. Back in the state, she had the question given to her. Why do you do that? There's more people at home. Why don't you help people here? Her answer is, I serve a great God. Our great God can minister and have food for both. And so it is. We serve a great God. There are lots of things we can do, and we promise to, what is it, um, with our talents, our gifts, our service, and our resources. I don't know what God wants you to do, but I know he wants you to pray about it. And I know he has a job for you and for us to do together. And so we serve a great God. He has work for us to do. Thank you. And now I invite you to join me in one of our professions of faith. This is the World Methodist Creed. It is in litany form, and you will join me in the bold print that you will see. You will also find this in the back of your hymnal, which is number 886 the World Methodist Social Affirmation. We believe in God, creator of the world and of all people, and in Jesus Christ incarnate among us, who died and rose again, and in the Holy Spirit, present with us to guide, strengthen, and comfort. We believe God help our unbelief. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, in each act of self-giving on behalf of others, in the abundance of God's gifts entrusted to us that all may have enough. In all responsible use of the earth's resources, glory to God on high and on earth peace. We confess our sin, individual and collective, by silence or action, through the violation of human dignity based on race, class, age, sex, nation, or faith. 
through the exploitation of people because of greed and indifference, through the misuse of power in personal, communal, national, and international life, through the search for security by those military and economic forces that threaten human existence, through the abuse of technology which endangers the earth and all life upon it. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ, to take up the cross, to seek abundant life in all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. The kingdom come, earth as it is in heaven. And at this point, I would like to invite Pam Kearse to come forward. She is one of our United Methodist women and our lay leader. Good morning. Let me get my things in order. I was asked to briefly share about UMW and what we are doing here at Central and in our community. First, let me say that all women, youth, and children are a part of UMW. You do not have to be an official member of an organized group to be considered a United Methodist woman. However, if you are looking to be more actively involved, there are several groups here that you can join, or you're always welcome to start a new one. We have a group that meets the second Wednesday of each month at 12 o'clock, or excuse me, at 10. This is the group most people think of when they hear UMW. We have presentations about various issues that affect our community and world. We deliver flowers to our homebound members, we collect shoeboxes for Armenia, and yes, we sell pecans. The money raised from these pecans helps to support various ministries, including the Community Kitchen, the Backpack Ministry, Pathways, Students at Pisgah, and the Pastors Discretionary Fund. We have a group that meets weekly on Wednesday evenings at 6. They are called the Soul Sisters. They have a vibrant fellowship time, and they participate in a variety of mission activities. They have fixed Christmas gift boxes for the Haven House, they put, supply, <clears throat> excuse me, they put supply baskets in the ladies' restrooms. They have fellowship movies and dinners. They are prayer warriors. They have a prayer chain, and they volunteer. They've helped with school backpacks, VBS, and they plan to help with the Habitat House. Many of our younger girls are involved in youth and children's activities on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday evenings. We even have a new Sunday school class for women that meets in the fellowship hall. Whether you are a leader or a member of any of these groups, you are a United Methodist woman. If you have participated in any of our church's many mission projects, you are a United Methodist woman. If you have donated items for the Haven House, backpacks for schools, shoeboxes for Armenia, or candy for trunk or treat, you are a United Methodist woman. You are greatly appreciated for all you do for our church, our community, and the greater world. Each year, UMW recognizes individuals who have, in various ways, contributed greatly to others and the mission of our church. And each year, it is very hard to select only a few to recognize. We are a very blessed church with so many people who do so much. But four individuals were chosen this year. And I can honestly say I was not part of that decision. If it were up to me, I would recognize everyone. At this time, we would like to recognize four individuals who have contributed to our church through their jobs, their volunteer activities, and their active participation in the life and ministry here at Central. If they are able, we would like for them to come forward at this time. 
Greg Hooper, Valerie Hooper, Aaron Gomez, Victor Gomez. As, as they make their way. Each is being presented this morning with a pen as well as a gift to missions in their honor. Greg heads up our leadership team and is our sound and technology guy. He keeps us on track and also works hard to make our services go smoothly from a technology viewpoint. Valerie is a pleasure to watch in our choir, is a member of Soul Sisters, and is our church liaison with our Haven House ministry. Aaron is our youth leader and goes above and beyond when an activity involves youth or children. Her motto is, go big or go home. Victor is a, good, is a great volunteer with our youth and a member of the men's group Theology on Tap. And last year, he was even Jesus on our Christmas float. <laughs> these are just a few of the many ways that these four people help in our church and things that they do. Please join me in a round of applause for them and what they do to show the love of Christ to others. And like I said, we have a pen and then a gift to missions was given in their honor. Valerie, thank you for all you do for Central. Aaron, thank you for all you do at Central. Victor, thank you for all you do. Greg, thank you for all you do. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes to highlight some of our activities and mission projects. It's always nice to recognize people and celebrate what they do, but it's more important to remember why we do what we do, and that is to show others the love of Christ. Thank you. O oh, great and holy God, in whom and through whom we have our very existence, we come to you this morning as individuals with all our concerns, our fears, our hopes, our sorrows, all those things that make us human beings. We ask for your blessing on each and every person here. We ask that you be with the family of Doris Plot. We ask also that you forgive us when we have done those things you would not have us do. Father, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your son. We have talked this morning about the whole human family, and we ask that you look with compassion on that family. Take away arrogance and hatred that infects so many hearts. Break down walls that separate us and unite us in bonds of love. Work through our struggles and confusion and our own desires to accomplish your purpose on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around the world. And Father, we pray for a new spirit in our church. God of power and justice and love, give to the United Methodist Church a new vision and a new love as well as new wisdom and fresh understanding. Renew us all as United Methodists and revive our brightness so, so that the eternal message of Jesus, 
the Christ may be heard and known as the good news. Help us to be diligent as the church scattered, as we learn to be and, and to make disciples. We ask these things in the name of him who makes everything new and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
you for um, listening to us this morning. We hope that you will understand how important it is for us to be United Methodist Women and for our missions all around the world. Will you please join me as we sing the summons? It's on the screen. 